Good morning, y'all. Now go ahead and stand with us this morning as we get ready to worship. I want to move. 
so you can move. Come and do what only you can do. I want to live in expectation of your kingdom breaking through. Sing that with me again. I want to move so you can move. Come and do what only you can do. I want to live in expectation of your kingdom breaking through. Because my hands are open, my heart is free. Open the heavens. Rain down on me, fall down on me, my hands are open, my heart is free. Open the heavens, rain down on me, fall down on me. I want to come to you in boldness, by your power I receive. Expectation with you, I'll do greater things. I believe in greater things. Oh, my hands are open, my heart is free. Open the heavens, rain down on me, fall down on me. My hands are open.
your hands to him if you're comfortable boy just lift your hands put them here something like that just open your heart to him as we sing this out I lift my hands up lay my whole life down my whole life down before you Jesus, 
our Savior. We lift you up this morning. We stand here as the people of God proclaiming that you reign. We know it doesn't always look like it, but we trust you. We trust in the work of the cross. We trust in the victory of the resurrection. Thank you so much for doing that for us, for giving us life, new life, and relationship with our Heavenly Father. Thank you so much for your love, your mercy, your goodness. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for singing with us. You can see. Good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday. Good to see y'all. I know summer is a busy time for everybody, so we're just glad you're here and you made it swung by your, you know, every now and then you swing by and connect with church and connect with each other. And we're just so glad uh, that you're here with us today. If you have not been here before or you uh, haven't given us your contact information, we would invite you to do that today. There's a QR code uh, in the chair in front of you and you can fill out that little simple uh, information form, basically just your name, email address, phone number. We'd love to get to know you if we don't know you already. And uh, again, if you're here to, and you're a regular with us and you give to Brownwood Community Church, thank you so much for that. You can do that again through the QR code, through brownwoodcommunity.com or on the box and the back of the wall. So today's the big day. We're sending off our youth group to camp. So Katie's been talking about this for three years now, I think. I think it's, it's been forever. Um, but thank you to this church family. Uh, Y'all have been so generous and gracious to, to send this group all the way to Florida. And I know my son is exceptionally excited about the 13-hour trip. That is all he's been talking about. Um, but seriously, uh, they did get the vehicle situation lined out. I know that we mentioned that last week, so praise God we do have transportation. Uh, so anyway, we are going to be loading them up and sending them off right after church. So we uh, asked those family members if you could stick around, help us load up, and then we're going to pray a blessing over their trip. Everyone's welcome to stand out in the heat and help us do that, um, but, but uh, especially uh, the families, if you would please do that with us. Well, all right, that's pretty much it for announcements today, and uh, we'll watch our bumper video and get started. What's up, Chief? Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to get a tattoo of my girlfriend's name on my arm. Great. Her name's Christina, uh, with a Y. <laughs> she spells it with a, a Y. Like C R Y S T I N A. <laughs> yeah. And, and she also likes hearts, so if you could do like a heart. She likes the color blue. And um, sometimes red. Great. 200 bucks. Let's go. <laughs> Remember, it's Christina with a Y. Yeah, I got it. It's like C R Y S T I. Oh, that's cold. You're joking, right? <laughs> that is perfect. Look at that. It's Christina.
you know, for 50 bucks, I can turn that into a dragon. <laughs> That's awesome. Anybody have a tattoo? Ex no, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. <laughs> uh, Y'all been coming just for the videos, haven't you? Yeah. You don't want to hear the sermons. You just want to see the videos. So I'll just pray and let you go home. No, I got to finish this up, right? No, welcome to Brown Community Church. Uh, I'm Scotty, the pastor here. If I've not met you, would love a chance to meet you before you leave today. Uh, we're in this series, and today's the last part of starting over this series where we're talking about this. We're talking about how to ensure next time won't be like last time, right? Because we got some stuff that's happened where we're having to reset restart. And sometimes that's not always through a bad thing, but a lot of times there's some kind of bad ending to something and you got to restart a, a bad relationship that ended badly. And so you got to restart in a new relationship. And you're thinking, I don't want this next one to be like that last one, right? We want it to be better because here's, here's what I said last week that anytime you start over, regardless of why you're starting over, anytime you start over, it's a chance to do things better, right? Better's, better's good, right? Yeah, better is, better is better, right? So anyway, whether it's a new beginning, starting a new job, a new career, a new marriage, a new relationship, new friendship, something like that, anytime you're starting over, it's, you, it's a chance for it to be better than the last time, okay? So uh, we've been going through this and reviewing some things. We, uh, we learn from our mistakes in the areas that matter least. You ever noticed that? Like if it's not a big deal or an important deal, it seems like we mess up and we start over and we get it right pretty quickly. But, but then, you know, the flip side of that is that we tend to repeat our mistakes in the areas that matter most. Have you ever noticed that? Like, is that true for y'all? <laughs> no. <laughs> We're going to pray for KV. Uh, own your crap, KV. Yeah, that was her message a couple of weeks ago. So uh, eventually we pick up on that. Like, Finances. You ever notice that you've made, if, if you're a person who's made some bad financial decisions in the past, man, it's like you just repeat that over and over and over. And you're like, what in the world? And you start noticing those things, or whether it's relationship issues, you know, people with relationship issues, it seems like they go from one bad relationship to another. And it's like, wow. And they start to notice it themselves. And you start to go, oh, man, why is that? That's so frustrating. We ask, when, when will I learn? Like, it's just, we think, I just need to, I need to learn that this is wrong, or I need to learn that this way is bad, and I need to learn that I keep making this bad decision or doing it this, the wrong way or in a bad way that's not healthy or all these things. And we, and we get frustrated because we keep repeating the same things over and over and over again, especially in the things that really matter. So there's some myths that cause us to do that. The experience myth. The experience myth, we think that, well, experience alone will make me better the next time. I've been through it once or twice or three times. A lady, is that a song, right? Old song. Uh, it's summer. Y'all got to laugh. It's going to be fun in the summer, right? So then, then, then we think that just experience alone, but experience alone like when you meet the person who's had 20 bad relationships, you're like, well, experience must not be the answer, right? E evaluated experience, if you pay attention to the, the bad experience, then you can learn from it and grow from it, right? Possibly. And then there's the other one after experience. It's the know better myth. Like we, we do this with our kids. We think they just need to know better. I mean, I deal with people uh, in the church world like that too. They they They... Y'all don't know any church people like this that want to talk about other people's sins and failures, right? And, and they think, well, they just need to know that's wrong. I'm like, seriously? They need to know stealing is wrong? And that's going to be, knowing better does not ensure that you will do better. But sometimes we give in to that. Okay, and then the time myth, the time myth, this is when it gets me. It's that lie, that myth that says time is always against me and that I'm running out of time. So I'm going to make this decision right now in a hurry because time is against me. I turn 50 tomorrow, y'all. I'm not getting any younger. And we use that to think, oh my gosh, I can't make a good decision. I don't have time to make a good decision. And we keep going, we keep going, keep going and, and, and staying in the patterns instead of taking the time to evaluate the experience. We just keep going, keep doing the best we can without spending much time on it 
because we think, oh my gosh, time is against me. Time is your friend, especially when it comes to getting things right and starting over and doing things better this time than they were last time. Time is on your side. God is the God of time. Time is your friend. If God is on your side, then time is on your side, right? And you see how that's a different way to think about time. We, we, we can't give in to this idea that, oh my gosh, I, gotta, I just got to make the best of it because time is against me. Okay, time is your friend. Say it. Time is my friend. Okay, there you go. All right, so we're talking about three things that we are recommending that you can do to make starting over a good thing and make this time better than last time. Okay, first, Katie talked about it. We've joked about it. She said, own it. But she said what? Own your See, y'all scared to say that in church, aren't you? <laughs> own your crap. Own your part of the pie. Whatever it was that went bad and happened, if it's that person's mostly their fault, even if it was 99% their fault, that 1% is yours and you got to own it, right? Okay, so own it. Then I talked about last week, rethink it. That's why that evaluated experience is important to, to pay attention to how you make decisions, to how you, how you think about relationships. If you found a pattern in your life of bad relationships, don't just think about trying to make it better next time. Take some time away from relationships, time's on your side, right? And think about how am I thinking about this relationship that's causing me to choose the wrong person, the wrong kind of person, or to act in a way that makes it in badly. See the difference? So we got to rethink it and allow the Holy Spirit to teach us to think differently. And then today we're talking about it's time to release it, okay? So I don't know if, I don't remember if Katie showed you a graph, but this is y'all's problem that happened, right? The blue is their, whoever they are, whoever the other person or other persons were, their part looks like the blue. And your part is this tiny little slice it says my part. The thing is, we've talked about you owning your slice. Regardless of how small you think your part is to play in it, you have to start with owning your part and then rethinking it. And then today we get to deal with the big part, right? Because don't you want, don't you want to deal with what they did to you? Don't you want to deal with what happened to you that, that hurts you and that seems to be uh, making life difficult for you? Well, today is how we're going to deal with it. But you got to start by owning yours, right? So don't skip that part because we want to jump to the blue, don't we? We want to talk about their part, but make sure you've done the first step that Katie talked about before you get here. Okay, so we're going to talk about today, how do we deal with it? Okay, so Katie talked about blaming and not owning. She talked about what that does. Just as blame enables you to smuggle your issues, right, you got issues, into your future unresolved angst over what others did to you, the blue part, enables them to smuggle themselves into your future. And you're thinking, no, I don't want that person in my future. Okay, that's why we need to talk about it. Because you don't want at least the bad parts of what that person did to smuggle themselves into your future. Because it will, if you don't deal with it, right? You have to deal with their part too. And some Christian circles will try to teach you and tell you, well, you just got to, you just got to, you just got to ignore that. You just got to, you just got to let go. You, you know, you can't hold on to stuff. And they try to, try to really, uh, it's shallow way of dealing with the other person's stuff. And it causes you to just not think about it. I don't want to deal with it. I'm just going to push it down. I'm just, you ever said this? I'm just going to move on. It, if y'all ever noticed when you do that, it might be two years later. It might be in the middle of that next relationship, hoping to take that next relationship to the next step or the next level in progress or something like that. And then suddenly that issue or that person shows up in that next relationship, right? You can't just ignore it. You can't pretend like it didn't happen. You do have to deal with the blue. You do have to deal with their part as well or else you'll just hold a grudge and you'll bring that right along with you. So let me ask you, if you're thinking about something 
in this series that you need to deal with, ask yourself this. How far into your future do you intend to carry the angst created in your past? Now, I have to tell you all, like, this sermon kicked my butt, right? Like, it, mm, God, there's so much. It's so easy to just drag that stuff along, and it's heavy. You notice it's heavy. It's like the more you accumulate over your life, you just keep dragging it along. If you don't, don't take the time to do this and, and deal with what they did to you, then it comes along with you. But how far, like, would you like to, like, mark on the calendar and say, okay, I'm going to take it this far, and I want to get rid of it and deal with it by the time I get to, yeah, July 1st? like a few days from now, or maybe J July 4th to represent freedom, right? How far? Like, w could, you, could you answer that or would you answer that? You'd be like, no, I don't want it I don't, today. Like today's the day. I want to be done with it today, right? And then how long, how long do you intend to allow the people who mistreated you to influence you? Because that's the frustrating part. Is it like, yeah, and maybe... Maybe legitimately your pie looks like that, like 95% is what they did and you maybe had 5% of it. And how, how long do you allow that mistreatment that hurt what that person did, and maybe they even did it 100% on purpose. They were trying to hurt you and they did. And how long do you intend to let that angst over that thing or things, whatever it was, a betrayal, sabotage, slander, whatever it was, how long do you plan to allow that hurt and that angst to influence you into your future? And it's, it's something to think about. It's something to spend some time on because you don't want them to show up in your future. You don't want them to keep showing up in your future, every time you go to that next job, it seems like that boss that treated you unjustly, I had a boss that did that one time, and it's like every new place I showed up, it's like the, mm, of what he did to me. It was so wrong and it hurt so bad and it kept showing up, it kept showing up. Every time I'd start with a new boss, I'd be thinking, man, I hope he's not like that one. And it followed and followed and followed. How long do you want to let it do that to have that kind of influence over your life? Because they wronged you, but yet they still have some control over you. And you don't want that, do you? I mean, because they were the person who did it wrong, mostly, after you've owned yours. I mean, yeah, you don't want them to do that. So have you, have you ever met someone who's passed when you found out about it, what, that shocked you? you, you found out about this person you've been around, and you're like, this person is so full of joy, so full of life, and they seem to, like they don't have any bitterness or angst or, uh, and then you really get to know them, and you find out all the, like the crazy stuff that's been done to them and hurt them and happened in their past. You ever met someone like that and started going, man, it's hard to believe this person has been through anything hurtful or difficult like that. I had no idea what they had been through. They're so healthy and they're so normal. And, and how, did, how did they not grow bitter? How did they keep from that thing that happened as bad as it was? How did they keep from that coming into their future and causing their outlook on the next part of life to be so negative? How, how did they do that? Well, here's, at some point, what they decided is that my past, because they didn't forget it, my past will remind me, not define me. And, and you've, you've seen the person who's the opposite of that, where you're like, okay, like, I really feel bad for you, but like that thing that happened to you 10 years ago, like that seems to be your whole identity. You seem to be wrapped up in that still, and I'm like, that dude's not even around. He's not even here. 
and yet it defines you. Well, the best thing to do is say, my past can remind me, it can teach me and train me, but not define me, not become the defining characteristic of my life so that I can be victimized for the rest of my life. There's a way that God has given us to deal with what that person did to you without ignoring it. There's enough pain in life. There's enough pain, and I hate to say this because it makes me sound like a doom and gloom person. There's enough pain in your future to not bring the pain of the past with you all the time because it's just gonna pile on if you do it. So to ensure next time is better than last time, release the past so the past can release you. Did you know it's your decision? Mm Mm-hmm. It's up, well, in a sense, It's up to you. It won't happen. The past won't release you until you decide to release the past. And when you do, and when you do what we're going to talk about today, it will become a reminder, but it won't own you anymore. It won't be your identity. It won't define you. That's that's the transition that happens around this term that we think in religious terms of forgive. 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 And we understand that intellectually, that's something Jesus talked about a lot, obviously, and that's something Paul wrote about and taught about. And we're going to look at some of Paul's teaching on this and dig into this a little bit. And I'm going to give you a recommendation of an exercise I've already begun to practice myself. And, and it was kind of hard, uh, but it, it seems to be moving in the right direction of being able to finally let go and release those things from the past. Because forgiveness, what it does, it allows you to retain the lessons of the past and leave the angst behind. So let's look at what Paul says in the letter uh, we call Ephesians chapter 4. Look at what he says here. Uh, And Paul says, in your anger, do not sin. Now, I'm doing a lot of work personally in, in my own spiritual growth in life of, about how to deal with emotions and how to be able to define emotions and relate to my emotions in a good, healthy way. And uh, so much of my past was around angry, particularly angry men. I, I struggle to deal with anger because I don't know how to be angry. I've always seen angry as just such a horrible thing that I would ignore my own to the point where it overtook me and anger would just explode. So Christians a lot of times get taught badly or at least implied badly that anger is bad. Paul doesn't say don't don't be angry, does he? He actually says in your anger, in other words, he expects that when something happened to you, when that person mistreated you unjustly or did that thing that really hurt deeply, I think Paul would say, yeah, you should be angry. If something really bad is done to you and you don't feel angry, I would probably be more concerned for you then if it didn't, uh, than if it made you angry. Because anger is a natural, normal emotion to have. Paul says, in your anger, do not sin. In other words, if you're mistreated, be angry in the right way, but don't sin in that anger. It doesn't mean because if you're angry, you're sinning. You catch me? Okay. Then he goes on. He says, do not let, that's a choice, right? When he says, do not let, he says, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Now, I'm a bit of a literalist. And so I used to read that and think, oh my gosh, if, if, if Emily and I or me and anybody else ever have any issue between us, oh my gosh, we can't go to sleep and go to bed until we deal with this. We fix this and try to fix it. Right? You're going to lose a lot of sleep if you try to do that all the time, right? So my recommendation is to realize that Paul's using this to describe, okay, don't let the sun go down. Don't let the next season of life, don't let the next decision, the next relationship, the next thing down. Don't let the next time go down while you're still angry. Don't carry that anger into your future is what he's saying. And he's saying, don't let it because that means you decide, right? So it's on you. And then he goes on, he says, and do not give. You see, you see how much Paul is saying it's in your control, right? He's saying, and don't, do not give the devil a foothold 
Now, how many of you sat out this morning thinking, I'm going to give the devil a foothold in my life this morning? I mean, that's just ridiculous to even think about. And Paul's saying, oh, but you need to know, oh, he's a schemer. Oh, he's always, he may not be the one who directly caused that thing in your life that made you need to reset, but he sure seemed to be an opportunistic little sucker, and he showed up right in time to make it worse and to plant something in my mind to say that I'm doomed and this is always going to be my story and blah, blah, blah. He's, he's such a liar. He's such a schemer. And Paul said in this talk about anger and how to deal with those things, he said, don't you give the devil a foothold. Don't give him an opportunity. It would be a gift. Don't, don't give that person either the opportunity to go into your future, to, to gain ground in your life, to gain a beachhead, to use a, a war term, in your, in your heart and in your next relationship. Don't, don't give that to him by just holding on to your anger going into the next season. And that's exactly what will happen if we don't do what Paul is instructing us to do. There is a place for anger but keep it in its proper place. Keep it in its proper place. When, when you're angry, name it. Own it. And then begin the process of rethinking and releasing and the rest of the things that we're talking about. It's not bad to be angry necessarily. And then Paul goes on the next verse. He says, get rid of all bitterness. Look at the things he lists there. Where does bitter, bitterness come from? Holding on to the past, right? Get rid of all bitterness. Rage. Y'all ever seen rage? You ever felt it? Get rid of rage and anger. It doesn't say you don't ever have it, but get rid of it. Once it's there and you've named it and dealt with it, get rid of it. Get rid of, I love this. Like I grew up in a house with seven children and five boys, Right? There was some brawling that took place <laughs> in my household, and it wasn't pretty. Brawling and slander. See, all these things are what happen and what come about if you don't deal with anger in a, in a good way. Along with what he says here, every form of, of malice. And I was like, man, I see that word every now and then, and, and I don't really know what that word meant, so I did some, some word study on this in my Bible study software. And, and malice, you know what it means? Wickedness. Wickedness. And so when I think of wickedness, I start thinking of, you know, movies and stuff about uh, people who hold a grudge and are bitter about something somebody did to them. And they go to a, you know, a witchcraft person or something, what they're trying to do. And uh, y'all ever watch those kind of movies? I mean, probably back in the 80s and that kind of thing. But there's this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get them back. I'm going to use witchcraft or I'm going to use this, you know, curse or something like that. Because so I got to pay that person back. You know what that is? It's malice. It's wickedness. It's when you see that person and you see something bad happen to them and you laugh. Oh, you take pleasure in their pain. Isn't that twisted? Do you see how twisted that is? But that's what happens as we let it just continue to fester and boil up and become an issue. You take pleasure in their hardships and you begin to, you feel like you want something bad to happen. That's malice. That's bad stuff, isn't it? Paul goes on, he says, no. And remember, he's talking about in the context, this is the same passage. He's talking about all this anger and all the things that you need to get rid of. And, and so he's obviously talking about when relationships or when things go badly and you get hurt and you get angry and you've got a reason to be angry. Paul says, no, don't do all that. I want you to be kind and compassionate to one another. Dang it. Right? I don't want to be kind to him, to her, to them, the way they treated me. I don't want to be kind and compassionate, really. Ugh. And he uses the word we're talking about, forgiving each other, forgiving each other, even the person who hurt you, who wronged you, who betrayed you, who slandered your good name. And you're like, oh, but it's, 
I, I usually have conversations with Paul. I know that sounds weird because he asks a lot of us in his writings. And I'm like, Paul, but that's too much to forgive. I, and that's just, mm, oh, that's too much to forgive. And then Paul does what Paul does. Paul's a punk. That's my term of endearment for people who challenge me. <laughs> Y'all heard that here first. Tweet it. Scotty said, Paul's a punk. Yeah. Just as in Christ God forgave you, Paul plays his Jesus card, didn't he? You see that? He's like, I know, I know, I know. Do you think that's too much to ask? You can't ask me to do that. Oh, no, that's just too much. That's too hurtful. That just ruined my life. And Paul says, but the way Jesus forgave you. Okay. I at least can't argue with Paul, right? He's saying, forgive as you have been forgiven. Mm. And it does feel so churchy to say that because it preaches good, but it lives hard, doesn't it? Oh, man. But by forgiving you, God ensured that your relationship with God in the future was still going to be good and was still going to be okay. He did it for the relationship with you. He forgave you because he cared more about his relationship with you. He cared more about you than he cared about what you had done to offend him. He took it and nailed it to the cross like we sang about this morning. When you, when you feel that, oh, I don't want to do this, I don't want to forgive, I want you to think about a song like that that reminds you how much you've been forgiven and how much you've been loved, how much mercy you've been given and grace you've been given in God through Jesus and the cross. Don't ever, don't ever pull away from that. Keep that in the back of your mind at all times so that when Paul or someone in the New Testament writes and asks you to do something that sounds impossible and it sounds like, I just don't want to do that, just remember the, the, the cross says you have to if you want to follow Jesus. And the cool thing is, is that he will empower you and enable you to do it if you're willing to just keep following him. Forgiving the people responsible for you having to start over, that's what we're talking about. It ensures that what they did won't taint your future. And, and I know that's what you want, is you want that better future. You want the next time to be better than the last time. Sometimes you're, you're, you're grateful for a chance to start over. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's exhausting to start over, isn't it? You ever started over with a new church? Because that last church that stupid preacher, he said something, did something that really stung. And, and it takes everything in you to walk through that next church door, hoping, oh, I'm just, I'm exhausted to think about it, I, I, but I know I need a church family. <sighs> Man, starting over can be so necessary but in the church world, I've noticed because I'm a pastor, so I get to talk to those people sometimes. And I can tell when they're dragging their hate and their anger and their hurt from the last church. And you're like, oh, my God, you need Jesus, but I'm so afraid for you to be here because I'm going to be him, the past him, right? And it happens in every sphere of life where you pull those things and drag those things and keep them with you. You project that onto the next relationship, the next boyfriend, the next girlfriend, the next husband, the next wife, the next boss. It follows you. And you don't want it to follow you. Forgiving the people responsible for you having to start over ensures that what they did and what they did is true. What they did won't taint your future. My past will remind me, not define me. We say it with me. My past. 
I mean, if we just latch on to that. And, and make that our commitment. And we have to be willing to say, God, I'm going to do whatever it takes, whatever you ask me to do, to ensure that my past will remind me, not define me. So you're okay if I give you a little homework from this series? I've already done it. I've like done it as a pre-assignment. I've started working on this myself. This is so good. It's so helpful. And it's so hard. It's so hard. You got to take time to sit down with that thing that happened that they did to you or whatever the circumstances were and spend some time with it. And, and I just want to ask you, make a list of what they owe you. This is so hard. I mean, because here's, here's what happened when I started doing this. I thought I was going to have like three pages And it's not to downplay what happened, but, but the, I started realizing, okay, when I make a list of what they owe me, I mean, it's bad, and the things that are there are bad, but it's not three pages. It's, you know, it's a few things. It was a lot. It was heavy. But I, but I, had, to, I had to really spend time going, okay, because anger comes from thinking they owe me something. Y'all know that? That's where anger comes from, thinking somebody owes you something. And you start writing that down on paper, committing to write it. It's like, oh, yeah, I feel like it owes me. I feel like it owes me that, owes me that, that relationship, that time. Wh whatever that is, that person owes me friendships because he took friendships with him, with her, Right? That person, God, what they did to me, it stole my peace. It took my peace, and I've had struggle with peace, and he owes me, she owes me peace of mind. And they owes me because of the slander and the way he talked about me in public and to other people. He owes me my, 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 my integrity. He owes me my reputation. And, and when, you, when you do this, make a list of what they owe you, get real specific, and it, it really is a part of owning it, too. And, and when you get real specific, here's what it'll do. You know that sense of generalized anger that we tend to walk around with sometimes and when there's been some bad stuff happen, we just kind of carry, oh, we just don't, we don't pay attention enough because we don't want to give in to anger because we're good Christian people, right? And, and we just, it's like this generalized, uh, low-grade anger right there all the time, and it's not specific enough to deal with it. But doing this, oh, man, getting specific, it's amazing. It's kind of amazing what it will do. It will deal with that generalized anger and make it more specific so you can deal with it. So you name it, you call it out, and you plead and you ask God to help you. And then once you've spent time with this list and allowed God to work on you and to help you, then you decide and write it. You don't owe me anymore. You ever had a bill forgiven? A debt forgiven? paid on your behalf. That freedom for you costs someone else something. And that's what forgiving feels like. It feels like, well, they owe me, but I'm the one paying. But Jesus says, and Paul says, it's the way of Jesus. It's the only way that Jesus gives us to deal with what's been done to us. He doesn't give us an out ever. And he demonstrated it so well. What did he say on the cross? As he's agonizing and in pain and suffering about the very people who made him suffer, he says, Father, forgive them. And you might even quote that and use that in this process to say, Father, forgive him because he doesn't and didn't know what he was doing. He didn't know the hurt, the depth, the pain, 
and suffering that it would cause me. And so I'm going to ask you, forgive. Forgive them. This is what it means to forgive, is to decide. And by the grace of God, be able to do it and say, you don't owe me anymore. Not anymore. You did, and I may have been waiting for you to pay up. I've been waiting for that apology that seems to never, it's just never going to come. Don't keep waiting on them. And you may not ever do this with them in person. It's not always possible, right? But for your sake, you need to be able to say this. I, you don't owe me any more. And your future is too valuable and your future is too important to hold on to that and to be waiting to collect payment. It's with the grace of God, saying you don't owe me any more. That's your homework. Make a list. Be really specific, as specific as you can get, and then pray and ask God. And when you feel God's ability in you, releasing you to write it and declare it for yourself, say you don't owe me any more. And then don't forget, you got to start with your part. Don't skip this because you won't be able to forgive this big blue part until you've really owned your part. And if you'll do this, if you'll do this, you'll begin to feel free. You'll begin to feel the freedom and, and get out from under that heaviness and that weight that you've been carrying into your future one year, one month, one week at a time. And you'll know you've begun to make progress when you begin to feel for that person or those persons what their heavenly father feels for them. You know what your heavenly father feels for them? Compassion. Compassion. When you've sinned against God or other people, usually it's both, you know what God felt for you? Like his initial most natural response to your sin? Compassion. Not anger. Not anger. Not, 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 not wanting to pay you back and get at you, but Compassion. That's his very nature. And we want to be like our father, our heavenly father. So we want to own our part and forgive theirs, even if it looks like this. Your past should remind you, not define you. Release the past so the past will release you. Let me pray for you. Father, I know this is a tall order and I'm just here to speak for all of us to say we can't do it without you. We can't do it without you. The wounds are too deep. The hurt is too big. It's, it's too overwhelming. But in your grace and the understanding of Jesus and how much we've been forgiving, if you'll work that in our hearts through your spirit as we spend time reflecting on what it is that's been done. That you in us can help us to release the past. Thank you for your grace to do so. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you need any help with this process idea, we, we have multiple people who can help you with that. I can meet with you. Uh, Susie Harkey, our counselor, can meet with you. Uh, Miriam Callahan is another counselor that is part of our church that can help you walk through some things to release the past if you need help dealing with that. If you feel like you just can't do it alone, please don't hesitate ever to reach out to us. You can just email at brownwoodcommunity at gmail.com. If you can't remember that, just remember scotty at brownwoodcommunity.com, okay? Email us and let us know. We would love to walk with you and pray with you through this kind of thing if you need it. God bless you. Have a great week. Don't miss next week. We're going to start a new series about the Bible for grownups. God bless you. And join us as we pray and send off our youth if you got time.